Jennifer, this is a hybrid meeting of the housing partnership. And I'm gonna hand it over to Gwen, the chair. And if you wanna kick it off with um, the, the official start of the meeting, now that I think we got the technical stuff taken care of. Okay, thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, okay, the first thing, welcome to the housing partnership meeting in Northampton. Um, so just so everybody knows this meeting is being recorded um, and I'm wondering if I could, I'm going to get a roll call. Um, so Beverly Bates. Here. Richard Abuza. Hannah Schaefer. Gordon Shaw. Present on Zoom. Melissa Fowler. And me. Gwen Nabad, present. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if there's any uh, public comments that anybody has to make right now, um, we can take a few minutes to listen. I don't see any raised any, hands. No raised hands, no public comments. Okay, thank you. Our next activity is to approve the minutes from July 1st of 2024. Moved by Richard. Can I get a second? I'll second. Second and third. Thank you. So we should do a roll call on that. Uh, let's see. Beverly? Aye. Or yes. Richard? Yes. Hannah? Gordon? Yes. Melissa? Gwen? Yes. Okay. Minutes from July 1st, 2024 are passed. So anybody out there in the public who is wondering where the minutes went, um, they are going to be up soon. And so tonight we are having a conversation with Mayor Gina Louise Shera on housing strategy in Northampton. And so we will commence that conversation now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hey everybody. Hope all is nice to see you all who are on Zoom. Um, I'm Gina Louise Shera. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with you this evening to have um, a strategic planning session for the Northampton Housing Partnership. My goal is that we sort of leave this meeting today with a work plan for this this year. We're sort of at the, kind of almost at the start of, we're a little bit past the start of a fiscal year, but sort of we're moving into the heart of a fiscal year. Um, so, you know, I'd like us to have a, a plan for this year. Um, I just want to I'll just start by sharing that yesterday I went to um, a home welcoming for the three Habitat for Humanity um, homes on Burt's Pit. And that was um, beautiful and moving as it always is. It's an absolutely most stunning location. Um, it also was the culmination of 30 years of, of history that got to that day. Um, this was land that was um, from the former Northampton State Hospital and in 19, 1994 was part of a disposition of that land from the state um, <clears throat> to actually the Northampton Housing Authority to provide housing for Department of Mental Health um, clients. And um, it was deeded to the Housing Authority in 1996, but the capacity for its development wasn't, wasn't there and it didn't happen. Um, and then in 2016, so 10 years, um, uh, actually 20 years later, the Housing Authority formally voted to relinquish that property back to the Commonwealth, which then um, could deed it to the city. Now that process took another four years um, and uh, and all of that resulted in these three beautiful homes that um, these three families are moving into very soon. So that was just really remarkable. And then three weeks ago, I also went to um, a wall raising on Woodland Drive for another Habitat home site 
that was made possible by zoning amendments adopted by the council in 2021 when I was still a counselor um, that provided flexibility in the regulations that um, uh, allowed housing to be there. So that project um, was actually the first project that was permitted under those new rules and also had about, I think, a, a 30 year history um, because those it had been those, that had been an unbuildable section of that property at, from a subdivision. Um, because it didn't meet the sufficient depth that the zoning had. So um, so those changes allowed 30 years later for, for actually one habitat house and then another market rate house um, to be built on there. So that was pretty remarkable. And then next week, um, I'm going to the groundbreaking for Prospect Place, which is the former nursing home on Bridge Road um, that Valley CDC is developing into 60 family apartments, um, which is a very exciting project that, you know, I think we've all passed by that, that nursing home for years and years and years. And, and, um, it felt like such an incredible waste and shame for, for that property to be there and not be housing. So, um, it's very exciting that's happening. And then a few blocks from there, there's Cook Avenue where, which is going to be another habitat project. So I tell you all of this, not, not so much, not to like toot our, our horn necessarily, but really sort of share, share the fruits of the labor of this work, right? Like these are homes for, for families that are, are gonna be able to move into Northampton and afford to move into Northampton. And, you know, hearing from those those families yesterday is just, um, is just so touching always. And um, it's why I do this work, it's why you do this work. And so I just, you know, I have this incredible privilege as mayor to be, I get to be at moments like that. And it's one of the most beautiful things about um, my job. And so I just wanted to sort of share, share that I'm having those experiences. And I hope that um, you all are proud of the work that you do to, to make those properties happen. Um, so in a nutshell, I would say my vision is to take every opportunity that we see and help facilitate creating homes for people. Um, you know, I, ha as I said, I have the privilege of talking to Wayfinders and Valley CDC and Habitat and community builders and and um, hearing from them about uh, how much they wanna work um, with Northampton. And that's why they do so much work here. And, and um, I really wanna credit the planning department and Carolyn and um, all the work that they do to create opportunities and um, create opportunities for projects, uh, create opportunities for finding locations, um, work, really hard to think creatively about possibilities that maybe, you know, so for example, that um, what I was talking about, the the zoning change that allowed that land that sat there for 30 years to then be able to be housing. Um, behind us, I think is like the example I will use for the rest of my life of unbelievable creative thinking where there's, a, you know, there's land that no one ever could imagine would be affordable housing that has a uh, kind of broken down, um, uh, steps and will be housing for the most vulnerable people in our community. So I just, I really want to give remarkable credit to uh, the Office of Planning and Sustainability for just um, finding finding spots for homes in places that people um, really can't imagine there could be homes. So I'm, 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 they really do remarkable work and I want to um, acknowledge that. So anyway, moving on, I just wanted to share sort of those personal experiences that I've been having with you all. Um, but let's talk about our shared passions and interests in housing um, and work on establishing a framework for supporting housing, both subsidized affordable housing, um, as well as just housing creation in Northampton together. So um, Carolyn's got a PowerPoint. We've had some changes and additions to the partnership recently. Um, and, uh, you know, there've been some great accomplishments over the last couple of years. I know that some of the bills and the recommendations that the partnership worked on were successful. Some are, were not or not yet. I still, I, I still hold out hope for the broker fee home rule petition, which is a, a baby for me. <laughs> um, so, you know, we always keep pushing, uh, even if we don't, even if we're hitting resistance, we're going to keep pushing. Um, so I thought we'd kind of go through, um, and talk about some stuff. Um, before we do that, 
Also, I think, I don't know if all of you know, but Keith Benoit has gone on paternity leave early, which is why he's not here. I don't know if, if you all have heard that. Yeah. So he'd planned on um, scheduling the leave on September 20th, but um, the baby had other, had a different schedule in mind. Yeah, that's um, exciting. yeah so that's, so Carolyn is covering um, for him tonight and then till he returns, right? For, for the, for the partnership. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and also I want to acknowledge, um, Gwen as, as the new chair of the housing of this partnership, um, and Bev as the vice chair, you both were two of my very kind of early appointments as my time in mayor, as mayor to this. So, um, that's very exciting. And, and I thank you for stepping into those roles. Um, I know, I, you know, I know from talking to you, of course, for years, how important safe and affordable housing is and how, how much of a passion it is for you. So thank you for, for doing this work here. Um, and then, uh, so today I just want us to take some time, Carolyn, we're going to reflect on the history, um, and the work the partnership has done and talk a little bit about the changes in the economy that have affected housing since 2019, um, on top of the growing gap that's been happening for decades and decades in housing. Um, and, um, you know, as housing has become a, sig uh, you know, a signature issue for the state, which is great. Um, you know, we want to talk about what opportunities that provides for us now that the state is really focused on this for pushing our work forward here in Northampton. Um, so we want to just kind of work on a framework for today of, of what we want to work on, um, and, uh, what opportunities we can take advantage of in the bond bill that passed, um, and other other things that the housing partnership can work on in terms of regulatory ad and advocacy and policy work in general. Um, so I think that's pretty much we, oh, I mean, a few more things, you know, I think, um, you know, we wanna talk about the supply problem we have in general, right? So um, obviously we have a main focus on affordable housing, but there's a supply problem on housing throughout the Commonwealth in general, and certainly here in Northampton. Um, and we you know, wanna talk about housing opportunities for people of all backgrounds and incomes. And I know that, um, I think you all have looked at the Donahue Institute's report that projects housing um, needs by Massachusetts region. Have you, has the partnership talked about that? No, um, I have looked at some things, but I'm not sure if it was the Donahue. The one from a few years ago, or is yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, year and a half, two yeah. years ago, yep. Um, so we haven't seen housing starts at all income levels, particularly workforce and middle income housing. There's a particular squeeze there, um, for for folks who are at or below 100 percent of the area median area median income. Um, so that is certainly something that I think we feel here in Northampton and is has been acknowledged um, by the governor and lieutenant governor as, as sort of a main focus for the state as well. Um, so I think I'm ready to pass this on to Carolyn to talk about um, just sort of review some of the history and um, kind of talk about some some the what we've been seeing um, so we can then kind of move into figuring out what how we want to focus our work um, for the next year. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so I just want to just jumping off of um, the mayor's comments. I'm just a lot of you know this, but it's sort of the foundational work um, of the partnership. But, you know, sort of going back to 1991, when the affordable um you know, affordable housing was not necessarily universally accepted as something that we all needed to work towards as a community. Um, the housing partnership was born into that sort of environment. And it was really critical for the partnership to um, make sure those conversations were at the forefront. Um, not all city councilors or other, you know, appointed or elected officials really thought about um, the need for a subsidized housing and supporting that. So 
um, the role for the partnership was really beneficial in terms of helping not only to preserve the existing units, monitoring those existing affordable um, housing units and preserving and helping to preserve those, but advocacy for new affordable housing. And clearly those um, that work um, led to successes in the early 2000s and gradually over the last 15 to 20 years, I think the idea of affordable housing and the need for the city to support subsidized housing and develop programs, look for grant strategies, you know, talk with um, developers um, has really come to fruition in that, you know, everyone sort of accepts the fact that this is our, you know, we have to be um, make concerted efforts um, to target housing that's addressing um, places for people who are the most vulnerable in our community and close those gaps um, between, you know, affordability and, and supply. And so I think um, that changing sort of dynamic and conversation result um, is seen in, in the funding sources, not only just the new funding sources at the state and federal level, but also locally, um, which partially state, but um, that sort of funding back in the day in the 1990s for affordable housing was really um, largely funded through block grant. Um, but then in 2008, um, the CPA uh, funds were added to the mix. And it was good timing because our um, block grant uh, allotment has been dropping steadily since, um, you know, way back um, in the late 80s. So this graph just shows that sort of decline in our allotment, which means it's less money that we have that we can help provide um, those applicants who are looking to build affordable housing. But as so as that's declined, we've had other grants. So we have um, CPA, we have Housing Choice, there's 40R, which is another state program for um, supporting and um, supporting the regulatory framework for developing housing, but also providing financial support to communities once those housing units are built. And it was sort of a a sweetener for um, places like Northampton, but especially places across the Commonwealth where affordable housing is not such um, is not so well respected or the interests are there's more fear, I guess, about developing affordable housing in some communities across the Commonwealth. Um, MassWorks is another great resource for funding and supporting that infrastructure that enables affordable housing projects to move forward. And the city has availed itself of those um, funds as well. And then, you know, strictly speaking, see um, capital improvement funds to help um, provide soft costs for pre-development work has been allocated by city council and through the capital improvements program. Um, and then, so I just wanted to run through these um, great numbers um, for us in terms of just the last five years. So this this combination of funding in Northampton has resulted in 235 units of housing. Some of them are still coming online, so they're not completed yet. But um, they range that that was funded through a range of um, soft costs and full construction costs through CPA grants, capital improvements, um, uh, municipal vulnerability, C, um, and short short term rental um, fees. So this chart, I just um, Keith um, and I sort of put these figures together about the total number of units and the total dollar amount for um, the funds that the city supported to help make these projects come to fruition. So about $4.4 million um, in total funding across 11 projects to um, result in those 235 units. Um, in addition to the, the financial support, the other piece of that are, are that's um, not showing up in the numbers per se is the value of land that the city 
has been able to um, provide or or essentially gift for a dollar to these affordable housing developers. So the parcel behind um, this new parcel that you can't see in space, but it's there for the 30 units um, for 27 Crafts Avenue um, was valued by our appraiser at about $1.25 million. Um, we have lots, you know, the Woodland lot, the Cook Avenue lot, the um, Burt's Pit Road lots, Laurel Street lots, all of those have value that um, has um, the city has brought to the table in addition to those um, funds, those sources. Um, so, you know, this is this is great work and we hope to um, continue that, especially taking advantage of the um, new monies that will be coming forward you know, or as a result of the passage of that um, Affordable Homes Act and bond bill. So just by comparison um, to other communities, I we just pulled Amherst for an example. You know, Amherst does a lot of affordable housing development as well, but they are, they're over that same time period, fewer funds, fewer projects, and fewer units. So by comparison, Amherst has funded 3.7 million across CPA, um, they have an affordable housing trust, but block grant and ARPA funds. So even combined with those sources, they don't add up to either the total number of units, which is about 126 units, um, I'm sorry, 136 units and five projects. Um, and then just to dive in a little bit more deeply about the CPA and the percentages of housing that's been um, funded, um, relative to the overall CPA allotments, um, you know, they're all, so um, CPA funds historic preservation, affordable housing, open space, and recreation. So um, looking at that affordable, all of these are sort of right in about the 25% range in terms of um, spreading those CPA dollars. Um, so um, fairly um, consistently across the board. The thing about housing is how expensive it is and um, the total costs for housing. So the money that CPA can provide um, is really beneficial for that leveraging component so that um, habitat or um, valley um, community development can go out and say, look, there's local support for this. And so that leveraging of you know, $6 million for affordable housing since the beginning of CPA has resulted in over $162 million worth of um, housing investment. And um, so um, more recently, the example of um, Prospect Place CPA funds, as well as um, short-term rental and some block grant funds um, amounted to about $600,000 of city money. Um, to help fund that, if I've got my numbers correct, but the prospect place cost of construction total all in is about $25 million. So, um, you know, all of that, you know, support from the local level really helps those um, housing developers, you know, go after those big dollar amounts that, you know, neither the state or Northampton could nearly fund on its own. Can I ask a quick question? Or yeah. So and often it's a requirement to show that there's yes local support. So those that's sort of that's what that's how that leverage works is that you know if they can secure that local support, then it opens up these opportunities. Right. Correct. Yeah. And and so yeah, so they're so we're we're mutually interdependent, I guess, <laughs> um for that. Um, so other tools that have been used in the housing partnership has been, you know, um, participate in this is sort of, we talked about the land acquisition and disposition. So Laurel Street and there's the state, former state hospital properties were on a path to go to the housing authority, but the housing authority um, couldn't um, bring those parcels to, to fruition. There, um, you know, there have been changes uh, over time. So this goes back like 20, 20 years when the state hospital was first um, sort of um, the land was 
um, distributed for specific um, purposes. And so the city was able to work through the legislature to sort of reallocate the land that had originally been um, solely targeted for the housing authority to be brought back to the city so that then the city could um, give that land um, in this case for both habitat on Burt's Pit and then also on Laurel Street to Valley CDC. Um, and then of course, supporting permitting for affordable housing is really um, was really critically important and it's been important over time to just sort of have that conversation in the public and education about the importance, um, again, keeping affordable housing at the forefront of the conversation in the community. Um, and of course, um, studies and evolving studies going back, you know, the mid 2000s, the impediments to fair housing um, and unlocking opportunities, also sustainable Northampton was sort of the guiding documents that the housing partnership has um, been um, intimately involved with and then helps provide that guidance for the next steps of things to work on. Um, and then the mayor mentioned legislation, council resolutions. Sometimes they're, uh, they're they're sequential and they work together, but those are very critical to showing Northampton support both for statewide legislation, but also funding. Um, and then of course, um, funding specific housing projects as well. Um, so, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about the changing needs and the mayor talked about this. It's that, you know, we've been talking about a housing gap since the early 2000s. I think there was a council resolution in maybe 2003 or four um, um, talking about the need for the partnership to um, try to investigate the housing gap because of the increased um, need in the community. Um, and we really haven't caught up even from there. So this this is a 20, this is more than a 25 year old problem. And I think some of the articles that Keith has forwarded to you all recently sort of show that across time, across the country, that we have a problem with um, that housing gap. And in Northampton, you know, median sale price is around four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Homes typically are running five to eleven percent above asking price, and um, seventy five percent of the sales. Are go above list price. So there's the demand is just far exceeding what the supply is for housing, which again has put constraints on every level of um, housing. So if you've got people who could afford a more, you know, um, a higher cost in housing, but there's nothing there, they're going to be looking down, down ladder to lower cost housing units and outbid people who don't have the ability to pay those, um, um, pay for, you know, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollar homes. And so then it just continues to push um, that pressure down all the way down to folks who are just not able to qualify for subsidized housing, um, but they're in the 100 to 120% of AMI. Um, so I just, for numbers sake, you know, the AMI now, a family of four at 80% of AMI is about an $80,000 a year salary. So the mortgage um, for that, uh, you know, counting on one third of the um, salary of an $80,000 um, household is about $2,000 a month. And so um, you're talking about um, a three hundred thousand dollar house um, that could be purchased, and you know, looking at the market, there are very few homes in that range, and that's someone at eighty percent who does qualify for subsidized housing. But even if you go to a hundred percent, or even to one hundred seventy-five percent, and look at the salary ranges there, and what house prices could be affordable if you're just talking about paying one third of your rent. Um, you know, even at 175% of AMI, the house price is 625,000. There are still, I mean, there are more homes in that range and above, but there's still not many even in that range. And these are all folks who have 
no ability to qualify for subsidized housing that is being built by the habitats and the valleys and the wayfinders. Um, and so just as sample salaries, so the average salary in Northampton is about $54,000 a year. Um, city department averages are below that in some cases. So people who work at the parks department or central services, you know, right around 50,000. Um, police, you know, excluding overtime, 64,000. Senior services um, employees, um, 50,000. So, and teachers, about $80,000 um, a year average. So, you know, these... Uh, all of these types of um, uh, people who are in these types of jobs are going to be struggling to find housing in Northampton. They work in Northampton. And, and so that means they're going to be pushed further out probably to find housing that, um, which has a huge impact on transportation and our carbon footprint. So um, I just wanted to highlight that a bit to, um, you know, that shows sort of our our problem here. And I have pulled a sample housing every once in a while. Um, I'll find some surprising numbers. So these are examples of small houses that have been on the market that are, you know, $400,000, $430,000. And they're a thousand square feet. And, and many times they're in need of um, significant upgrades you know, for energy efficiency, for windows, it's just their um, structures have not been substantially maintained or updated. And so this is the problem as well, that I think these articles that we've been seeing out there are talking about the fact that we're, because we're not building new units, um, we're not um, continuing to um, have that sort of downscale or or naturally occurring affordable housing from the older units that aren't necessarily falling into disrepair, but they're in that level that um, could be um, uh, provide something that's attainable is what um, we've been talking about um, in the city here. Um, so, you know, I just, wanted to sort of have that as the backdrop and also continue that conversation about potential strategies and um, uh, projects that the housing partnership, I think, could be really, um, could, could sink its teeth into and sort of think about in terms of helping the city try to push through this and, and start to um, chip away at this gap and that it relates to potential zoning changes. Um, Councillor Jarrett is um, working with some other councillors about conversion of um, existing garages to housing. So the, these are already structures that would um, essentially are non-conforming because of their setbacks as it relates to housing, but they were conforming built as garages that are closer to the lot line. So um, I think there's going to be a important conversation needed throughout the community about this um, idea of um, providing opportunities for housing for both people who own homes and maybe have too much space. They might need some income themselves to help offset their increase in costs, but also providing that additional housing. Um, so I think it would be great to, um, I think it would be important to start those conversations um, with the counselors about sort of where they are thinking about moving this. We also have something that we haven't taken uh, um, advantage of yet. It's a um, relatively recent uh, provision in the state statutes to allow for workforce housing or encourage workforce housing, which um, we get to define what workforce housing is as a piece of this, and the state defines workforce housing as up to 120%, serving up to 120% of the area median income. But this special tax assessment essentially gives a, a break for the first five years of um, after construction or rehab of units. Um, and it's locally determined about what that tax break would be. 
and then what the terms of those um, that would be and sort of what the what the return is for the city in terms of um, the number of units of housing and and who to whom it's targeted. The other piece of that legislation, if the city chooses to adopt it, it's sort of an opt-in um, legislation is that um, developers could access money um, from the state for building workforce housing. And it's a lump sum one-time um, distribution of funds of up to $100,000 per unit. Um, and so that's something I think that um, um, would be helpful to have the housing partnership sort of evaluate. Um, also, collaborations, I think, are really important. The Energy and Sustainability Committee has been working on um, rolling out um, energy upgrades for existing homes and helping people do rehabs, but that's really hard for people at the lowest income levels in the city. Um, and so I think I think it would be helpful for the members on the Energy and Sustainability Commission to understand what those needs are and what how difficult it is for people who are in um, sort of naturally occurring affordable housing that they don't have necessarily the same kind of investment opportunities that other folks have. Um, there's plan implementation, so we can look at the barriers to housing um, and the the funding the new funding from the um uh, bond bill to um continue that work that you've already started sort of um going through that checklist of um uh creating safe or preserving safe affordable housing and then of course funding advocacy always 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 <laughs> um with grant applications and you have one on your agenda tonight for um habitats requests for um cpc funding um and then the other piece is um what we're going to see more and more of is some of these older affordable housing units need rehab so the bigger multifamily projects so meadowbrook or even paradise apartments down on um, West Street um, are in need of upgrades, both energy, but also um, just general building maintenance. And if you think about Meadowbrook, that was built, I think in this, I can't remember the date, but I want to say maybe early 80s. Um, and what's that? 70s, 80s time frame. I mean, it's a huge um, project or property. And of course, there was a threat to the loss of those units now going maybe 15, 20 years back. And the Preservation of Affordable Housing um, nonprofit that's based in Boston bought Meadowbrook to permanently protect those units as affordable housing. But they need major reinvestment. And there isn't a lot of money for a deep you know, reinvestment in older properties. So getting creative about putting funding together. So CPC can't really fund a, um, that kind of rehab because it wasn't originally purchased with CPC dollars or constructed, I guess, with CPC funds. Same with Paradise um, Apartments. So you know, we can look at um, short-term rental funds, I think, but that's a smaller hot. Um, so that definitely would need to be leveraged. Um, but those are some issues that I think, um, you know, it's great. We see we need new affordable housing, but we also want to make sure that we're preserving our existing stock. Um, and then finally, I would say development advocacy. Um, I've got, you know, for workforce housing, but all housing really, because of that whole sort of, um, domino effect of not of having you know decades of um suppressed housing construction and supply that is really driving up those um um creating had created that gap and driving up those prices so you know i've got two pictures up here one is the um 107 william street which are 800 square foot units so we're looking at those as accessible or um accessible or attainable housing they're not subsidized affordable housing but as small units um clustered together 
they provide a potential opportunity for people to get into that ownership market that might not have otherwise been able to do that. And again, sort of thinking about those charts of people in the, um, you know, between the 125 and 175% of area median income, you know, we need housing at that level too. Same as the the uh, rendering on the lower right is a project that's still going through permitting, but again, small units, 800 square foot units, detached, um, clustered together, um, intended to be condominiums, um, but sort of targeting that market of people who are having a difficult time getting into um, getting into um, home ownership, and so. Uh, I think advocacy will continue and and sort of education and information to the public about why it's important to think about not just subsidized affordable housing, but units at all level, because they do really impact those people who are seeking out um, housing, even at the lowest levels. So um, I th that's sort of the end of my presentation and um, hoping that we can sort of um, you know, talk about this have, uh, and there's a lot to sort of bite off here. And I'm not suggesting that we dive in now on any of these items, but I think, um, you know, we'd love to hear your feedback. And um, so I don't know if you have any other comments, Mayor. You just reminded me of, you know, in terms of attainable housing too, I, I hear from, I often hear from people who are in houses that are larger than they need, but they don't feel like they can afford to to move into a smaller unit. So, so, you know, some of those smaller um, developments, I think are also, you know, important for people who are trying to get into home ownership for the first time, but also for people who are trying to downsize. And, um, you know, that way we can, you know, there's just, there's, it feels like there's gridlock in housing in general and people can't move anywhere because nothing's affordable or available. Right. And so, you know, if, if people can start sort of moving into, into housing that works for them at that, that place in their life, um, it can create opportunities for other people too. Yeah. And it actually sort of, I just had a conversation today with um, some people who are really, and have been looking for several years sort of in that category where they want to maybe move, think about moving into not assisted living, but sort of retirement living close into town where there, where there's community and they can walk places and there's just nothing available. Most of the, you know, most of these senior housing options are, have long wait lists, um, but also are far out and they're not meeting the needs of um, residents who feel like they want to be part of the community still, but they just want to downsize. But And they also want to be um, in an area where they might have or need supportive services. So, um, you know, anecdotally, they were talking about people who they know who have moved out of town and not just out to East Hampton, but like across the country so that they could move into one of these communities um, because they couldn't find anything um, in Northampton or even close by in the Valley. And so. I mean, there is a project on King Street that is senior or older adult housing. Right. But we also, you know, that project has not moved as quickly as I think we thought it would because of interest rates. They're waiting for interest rates to come down. Right. So that's the other thing is, you know, we we are in this moment in time where I feel like everyone's kind of waiting for a change. Right. And um, it's it's keeping people from moving projects forward. Yeah. Thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Um, it's a lot. And I guess I feel like I could have something to say about everything. Um mm -hmm. And if you feel like you're through with the presentation, I guess we could just discuss it a little bit or if anyone has any questions. Yeah, we, yeah. we'd love to hear what what sort of grips you from this and what, what you wanna work on and um, you know, what your ideas are. Um, one thing I, one thing that's at the top of my mind and I've been sort of clinging to it so I don't forget about it, but um, the workforce housing 
Um, I know like on the vineyard, on the islands, like housing is very difficult and then it's like very few number of families actually live there year round. And so there's like this huge influx of um, summertime families. And then there's like literally no place for the workers to stay. Um, and so that's, they call it the something shuffle, I forget. But um, so I was thinking about that because there is a, a quite a bit of tourism here in Western Mass. Um, not sure if it's to the degree of like the need for increasing workforce housing, but I think workforce housing can cover a lot of different categories. So I was kind of curious um, what that looks like. Like, what is that? What is that in the bond in the bonding bill? Is that in the bond bill? Is that a Okay. Right. And then um, there are, but there are sort of, there are new funding streams. And I think all of, so some of it is just understanding, some of it's reauthorization of funding for programs that were already um, funded, but it's just re-upping that. Others are new programs that we haven't, that, you know, the details are still coming, but the, um, the workforce housing has been around. And so part of it is helping to fund that, which I told you is $100,000 per unit for development. So some of that is funding that piece. And, you know, what's interesting is that special tax assessment and workforce housing on the vineyard and the Cape and Islands have a, have a much different um definition of workforce housing and it's up to 250% of AMI. Um, and so, um, and some of that is they actually had to vote on sort of what their number would be. And um, so I think there's flexibility for us to look at what that might be in Northampton's context, but um, it does vary and there, there are um, programs and I think newer programs that can sort of target that as well. Great. Thank you, Richard. Um, if you'll indulge me, I think I might try and comment and bring a bigger picture into this. I, I very much welcome the topic list you brought about collaboration, because I think that is something that I'll circle back to when we talk about the role of the partnership. We all know that housing is absolutely critical in so many ways. You know, it gets talked about locally, regionally, nationally, and, and we certainly have been believers in it. And, you know, the city has done a good job. And it, if you look even back further than the five year, you know, I've been on this for 30 some years, we've created a massive amount of housing and the housing partnership has been, been very active. But we're a volunteer board. We have been the original charter of the housing partnership which by the way, came out of the expiring use, which was the genesis when the huge multifamilies were, uh, that were built with the uh, subsidized housing were in danger of being lost. Um, the city realized it had to do something. It was a contentious issue. This board arose and, you know, we, as much as we wanna do the home ownership, you know, the first tier of bringing people who were having housing issues is usually rental. So we, we don't want to lose sight of that. And obviously prospect place is good, but we want to make sure that, you know, our programs are targeted to preserving some of the uh, affordable housing and also the little a affordable or the uh, de facto affordable. And so the original charter of the housing partnership was included that everything in the city that had any potential to affect affordable housing, uh, whether that's an energy program or parking regulations or um, you know, fire department regulations, that the housing partnership was supposed to be brought in so that all the people who were working on these things in the city could understand and recognize that they wanted to take, you know, they have to protect the health, safety, and welfare of everybody or whatever other tasks they need to do but that needs to be incorporated. And, and that's sort of been lost. One of the issues, if we're going to 
sustain a volunteer board that's coming in here, you know, and laboring, you know, without glamorous salaries or anything else, but because we care about housing, is we do have to have a meaningful role. And there have been a bunch of incidences in recent memory, which you probably know about, where somehow the housing partnership was bypassed. And there was even this forum for to get a citizens, we need a citizens group to support affordable housing. And the city held a forum and a workshop and got a whole group of people. And in the entire presentation, the housing partnership was not mentioned that you do have a volunteer city board that's been working on these very same issues. So if you wanna keep the housing partnership, it really has to be a partnership with the city to have us meaningfully in the loop. And that means that we need a commitment of staff time to make sure that if the that somebody in the staff is aware of all these other aspects and bringing them to us and bringing um, those uh, issues to us well enough in advance that if the, the other areas of city government don't proactively bring it to us, we can reach out to them and do our educational role because we not only have an educational role in the community, but we have an educational role within the city. Obviously, housing, as, as, as you have pointed out so well, you know, was sort of in the background back when, when we started on these issues and it's in the foreground now. Um, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't, uh, and so for example, um, there's this new state legislation, as I understand it, regarding accessory dwelling units. I don't know if our current ADU statute needs revision, but it certainly is an opportunity to look at it. And I can't think of anybody better to work with planning and zoning than the housing partnership to say, let's really be creative. You know, the state is saying, hey, listen, let's pay attention to this. And so I, I haven't heard that mentioned. But the other thing that I thought that was interesting that Carolyn mentioned, and uh, it, you know, you, you may not like hearing this, you talked about, you know, there's work that needs to be done in some of these older multifamilies and CPC is not eligible for that. In the housing partnership, one of the things that came out of the original expiring use was we were one of the path-breaking cities that had an affordable housing trust fund. And we were, we were leaders in that. We did it for a reason and it was targeted, but we still have it. It's on the books. And if you look around the Commonwealth, you know, cities all over the Commonwealth are saying, this is a wonderful tool. We need all the tools in the tool basket. And I personally find it very frustrating that the city is saying, at least as I understand the explanation that either CPC dollars can do all this or that um, we don't have the staffing time. And first of all, there are models for housing trust funds to be independently staffed, to not be a drain on the city. And there are things that we have done, little bits and pieces of projects to preserve affordable housing and preserve elders in their housing that have needed little discrete chunks of money to do these creative things. And I would say for me personally, and I, I don't know if people can speak for themselves, when we seemingly hit a brick wall about taking this institution that we already have, which could be dual staffed by housing partnership members um, so that we don't need to create a new city um, entity, or we could, but, you know, in theory, we've had a dual hat role as the Fair Housing Committee, and, and that hasn't seemed to be any problem. So I, as I, I welcome this presentation. You know, we all appreciate what the city has done, but we're really faced with an issue as a board. And I've watched it for a long time because I've been coming to these meetings for decades now. Um, it's important for us to be integrated in a way that we can sustain our energies as a board. And that really hasn't been happening. So I think that is as important an issue as all of these other projects because um, 
it may not happen with us if we can't figure out a way to do that. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. I can answer the um, ADU question for sure. Um, I think um, so the, the legislation was for um, communities across the Commonwealth who ha that have still have single family only zones. So it's targeted for those um, districts. And I think the partnership was involved in when the council went through and adopted the housing modifications to allow two families by right everywhere in the city essentially eliminated the single family home only zones. So um, we um, are, we don't, there no, there's no need to address that. I think the, um, the other piece that I talked about the zoning that Councillor Jarrett and Elkins are interested in um, targets a little bit of that sort of amps it up a little bit to look at opportunities to convert units that effectively would be ADUs, but we don't call them ADUs anymore. They're just a second unit because we don't have restrictions on the size or ownership um, responsibilities. So, um, and then in terms of funding, I think it's really, um, I think it's important to know that sort of I think we all overarching have this goal of we want to make sure we're preserving, we're not losing any existing affordable housing, and that we're providing the best, most cost effective way of both preserving and creating affordable housing. And, you know, there are many different ways to achieve the goal of preserving, um, preserving and creating more affordable housing. And some, you know, strategies are less cost effective than others. And so if the goal is to sort of target 50 units a year or a decade or whatever it is, I'm making up the numbers obviously, then you know, I think it would be beneficial to look at all the ways we might get there. And some people may think that some strategies are more effective than others, but we just have to sort of look at all of them and make sure that ultimately the goal is to protect the units or to create units. Um, and so there may be just different opinions about the mo uh, about what should be done, but I think ultimately we wanna use our time and money in the most um, effective way possible. Oh. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, some things that I was, that I've been thinking about, and I, I feel like a broken record at this point, but um, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, um, I, I I remember um, researching, and Hannah might remember this, about affordable housing trust funds and how that opens up for more funding, possibly from the federal government. Um, and But I don't know really ultimately where most of that money would come from um, or how that could work. Um, but I do know that if there was money in it and it was just kind of hanging out there, there would be potentially more flexibility with that funding. Um, for example, maybe with Meadowbrook or something like that um, where, you know, I'm a little confused about what happened to, is happening at Meadowbrook and why that can can you explain that a little more? Um I can explain a little bit okay, to, because it's thanks. not my project. So yeah. I don't want to um pretend that I know all the details, but you know, it's my understanding that the roofs need to be replaced, that siding needs to be replaced. I mean, it's kind of in a wet location. So after 30, you know, actually 50 years now, um, things just start to break down and wear out. And if you're really just doing sort of regular maintenance, but not sort of the deep in um, sort of structural repairs, they're also not accessible. The units don't meet accessibility, so they want to build in more accessible units for um, residents. And then finally, the um, they're not well insulated, and the energy you you know they're on gas now for pretty inefficient um, you know heating 
and cooling. So that's a huge transition for them to be able to make. Um, and it's really, again, about leveraging funds. So we do have resources. We also, as I said, that, you know, there are lots of state grants that, you know, can target infrastructure or even energy um, upgrade. So we have the Climate um, Action and Project Administration Department that has, you know, their eyes on funding sources that target um, energy upgrades. So sort of combining forces, looking at ways to um, put POA in, you know, um, collaboration with CAPA and with maybe the Housing Partnership to look at and, and the city to um, bring other funds to bear on that. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have any public comments, so yes, you may ask a question. Yes. Um, and so to say, my name is Benjamin Spencer, and um, thank you for um, all the work that you're doing. And um, yeah, some questions that just came to my mind during our conversation. Um, you know, so and and I'm wondering if this is the group that could like get these answers and, and moving forward. Like as far as conversion of garages and and like lot um, the way things are on the lots and all, this is about just like allowing people to convert garages even if they're close to property lines or is there zoning that would like get in the way of people converting garages into ADs at this point? Um, yeah, so garages typically are allowed to be closer to a property line than a residence. So um, the current stand, the current zoning setbacks in many districts are four feet for a garage to a lot line. So that goes back to, you know, the 1980s, maybe 1970s. So a lot of garages were built closer because then it gives you more yard space. You can have a little separation between the garage and the house. Um, and, but for residential use, the setbacks are bigger, typically 15 feet, let's say. So the idea is that there are uh, many sort of historic garages or carriage houses built even before the four foot setback that might have different setbacks, but don't meet the current residential standard. So converting those older historic structures that have um, value, um, but, but for, you know, investment into them just for a garage might not make sense. So we might have these, you know, um, really sturdy older structures that um, where property owners don't have the ability to convert those structures or, or invest and restore them because there's no income coming back. And so then they'll, they could potentially fall into disrepair, um, but they also are big enough or um, make sense to add residential units. So to add a unit into them. So what that means is, you know, we have to have this conversation with the community about that changing idea of a structure that you always thought was a garage now all of a sudden might be an apartment unit. Yeah. Right. Um, cool. So, and then the, you mentioned the opt-in legislation for the workforce housing, hundred thousand dollars a unit. Like that, is that something that the city council would look at and decide to opt in, or how does that, how does that come about? Yeah, it's ultimately so. There are a couple of components to it. So, the city has to put together a plan and a map of the area within the sort of central core of the city, and say, okay, this is our special tax assessment area and where we want to designate for um, encouraging workforce housing. And um, then the city adopts the policies that would um, be used within that sort of geographic boundary. And so there's a map that's created to say, this is where we're going to target these units. There's um, um, general um, layout of, or um, parameters 
drafted for um, what the tax assessment reduction or special tax assessment would be. And then, yes, that has to be adopted by city council. Started so when the day comes, yeah, it seems like a good idea. Why would we wait? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so so who who instigates who initiates that process? Is that this group that initiates that process? I think it would. I mean, there's a lot of groundwork that has to be put together, but I think our office would definitely work with and and develop a program if the housing partnership were interested in pursuing that. Um, and um, so that's where it would start. Yep. Cool. And then the only other question that I had, because um, I've heard this come up in a couple different meetings, including um, um, you know, some of the projects that you had on the on the board there earlier, concerns about um, properties becoming just Airbnb properties um, and not actually, you know, really being additional housing, but instead maybe not getting the use that you need out of them. And so I know there are some cities that are starting to look at Airbnb as like no longer something that's allowed. I don't have any sense for how many properties in Northampton are Airbnb. Um, so, but um, but I think that does make sense that we're taking properties that, where people could be living year round off of the available housing stock. And do you mean restrictions on Airbnbs that already exist or not letting housing that's being created, having restrictions built into that? I mean, I guess maybe however people think that would make sense and be fair and would be like passable. Mm -hmm. and we get a lot of pushback from people who are how would investments imagine so if we have more of it moving forward. Mm -hmm. That was, I mean, for the view out, I knew that was really kind of a, a concern that some of the residents in the neighborhood expressed mm -hmm. that, you know, that these are tiny little places that make sweet little rentals. Mm -hmm. You have someone come in and buy it, and then all of a sudden, you know, maybe you have people showing up from time to time, but it's not doing what we, what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Um, I was also thinking about Airbnb properties and how um, how Northampton is really dealing with that. I know you guys have had discussions about this. I think I've like heard that over the last few years, discussions about Airbnb properties. Um, and I'm not sure at what tax rate they're being charged right now, if, if that's a thing or um, how that works. Um, another thing that someone had mentioned to me, and it may have been Benjamin, is talking about how, how people really appreciate having the same neighbors that they can say hello to every day rather than um, people coming in and out on a constant basis and and things like that. So um, those are some of the things that I've heard around the city, um, as well as I'm really, really excited about um, the old nursing home. Um, I can't wait to see the process of that. Um, and I'm also really excited to see the, um, the, and I'm curious to know what's happening with the SROs, um, here, um, right behind us here on Crafts Ave and where that stands right now. Um, and I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, so, oh, great. Okay. Let's go to Bev. Uh, Gwen, um, I didn't mean to interrupt your. No, no, no um, that's okay. Thanks. Those Beth. are all really important um, topics. Great. I wanted to uh, uh, say a couple or observe one thing and ask another. Um, I wanted to echo uh, strongly what Richard um, laid out and only to add to it that um, I am a relatively new member of the partnership, a um, couple years, I guess. Um, and I am also somebody who's worked in the affordable housing realm for <laughs> more years than I care to disclose at this meeting. Um, and so I, I, I approached this opportunity in the hope that I could contribute 
what I've learned uh, over the years to um, helping make this community that I have come to love um, better, particularly in the housing realm. I know that sounds a little sappy, but that's how I came into it. Um, and the first conversations we had um, were really about um, sort of barriers. To the extent we can advocate, we can do one of two things. We can advocate for the things that the planning department and other branches of government say are important, or we can also understand barriers ourselves and contribute um, to the dialogue around how you uh, reduce or eliminate barriers. And when I say barriers, I mean, you know, obviously it's about land. Obviously it's about costs. Obviously it could be, I don't know, about zoning. Um, it could be about priorities because um, we've all talked about huge numbers of things. And while accessory units are great, it's a very slow boat to producing housing of any significant numbers. So that's what I mean by priorities. Where are they? Um, in any event, um, we talked about what we think the barriers are, and then we decided that we would like to hear from developers about what they think the barriers are. And having spent a long time working for a nonprofit developer, I think developers can be a very good source of objective information about barriers. Um, and so we were planning a developer roundtable. And the next thing that happened is we were told that one had already happened um, and that that was not where we belonged. And again, I'm only quoting what I was told. I have no firsthand information. But for me, that was very disheartening. And it made me think, is there a better way for me to spend my time uh, volunteering in Northampton? Um, and then a few other things played out. And as Richard described, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund idea went nowhere. Um, I think it is not unfair to say that there, was, there were the majority of the housing partnership members at that time that thought, let's quit and go do something productive. And I think it's important to say that, not to create a, a, a vitriol in the, in the room, but rather to say, as Richard started by saying very eloquently, you can't ask people to give up their time if they don't feel like they're accomplishing something because I don't know anybody who volunteers to sit here at this hour without dinner and uh, doesn't wanna feel like they're making a difference. So for us tonight, the number one goal, I believe, was to understand how we can add value. And Carolyn did a great job of describing both past and future goals and accomplishments and everything else. Um, I don't know that I leave tonight knowing exactly how I can make a difference. Maybe it's a much longer conversation than one night. Um, and I just, again, want to uh, join others in thanking you for all the time and energy that went into that presentation. But I hope we can keep talking so that we can motivate ourselves, um, feel like we're having impact. We have three vacancies right now on the board. On, I, excuse me, the partnership. I don't know if, I don't know how we recruit people to, to join when, um, when they walk in the door, we can't tell them exactly what it is that we're doing and why we matter. Thank you for listening to that. I have one question, and if you don't have time for it tonight, please feel free to skip it. Um, I've always, I've been curious since I moved back to Northampton, um, whether there is a um, planned synergy between the strategy to revitalize downtown Main Street and the gateways um, and affordable housing. Because my experience is that the most uh, vibrant main streets have a great uh, synergy, again, between housing and what's happening at the street level. And I have no clue what's in all of the buildings that have vacant storefronts, but it seems to me an opportunity uh, both to create more street traffic and to create resources to revitalize structures uh, that need clearly some rehab uh, to um, encourage 
a mixed use strategy, particularly along Main Street, but I would argue, um, again, along the gateways. It, and if that is part of the plan, uh, I just want, I, I'd be really interested in hearing about it because we have not, um, to date, had any sense of that. Thank you. Sorry I took so long. Thanks, Bev. Um, that also um, has my mind rolling about 33 King Street and what's happening with that. Um, that's such a cool spot. Um, you know, there's so much going on there. Um, and so I didn't know um, if anybody, if either of you could maybe talk about that and what's going on with that. Sure. Uh, let me just quickly tr try and answer Bev's question, um, which is that Yes, I think there's a lot of interest in the synergy, um, which is one of the reasons why, you know, uh, Carolyn's office for years has worked on trying to increase density downtown. It's one of the things, you know, one of the reasons why it was critical that the Resilience Hub be within downtown, one, because that's where people tend to be, but also that's where we're trying to connect people with housing, right? We're trying to bring those services together um, and meet people where they are to to um, get them into housing and help them meet their needs. Um, so it, it's absolutely something that, you know, I, I think all of these things are very much tied together and we are trying to keep all of Northampton vibrant, but very much the center of Northampton, we're trying to um, keep vibrant and like up the vibrancy, right? Bring, you know, bring about change there that's needed to increase people biking and walking and and foot traffic and people um, in those businesses, people in the residences above the businesses that you were talking about, you know, that's that's really critical for a heart of a city to have that space feel alive and have people there uh, day and night, whether because they live there or they're coming from elsewhere to partake in things. Um, that's that's really sort of at, at the heart of a, a lot of these projects is how can we um, bring all of this together and provide what people need, um, including our businesses. Thank you. I said thank you too. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for the question. I don't know if you're on this. Um, no, and I, I mean, I also want to be mindful of the time, but I, you know, it's certainly something we can dive in more deeply. But of course, the zoning modifications and the to encourage the reuses of the church building. So St. Mary's is again, so we're looking at um, encouraging the addition of units there as well as 10 Holly Street, that church. Um, so there's a lot of different projects and including 33 King, which is out, you know, again, the focus will um, likely result in um, multifamily dense housing and all of that to support the businesses and regeneration post COVID for sure. When I think of Holly street, I keep getting this vision of, um, with the church there, um, of something like, um, I think it's in Arlington or Alston. Um, the brick bottom artists, um, have studios there. So they live there and they have their studios there and it's very much like a social housing type thing. And, I remember when I was young, we would go to the yearly exhibits there. They would have open studios, and that was really cool. But I could see something really cool like that on Holly Street right near the art Center, uh, a mixed income sort of a thing. Thanks. Um, does anybody have anything else to say? If not, I'm gonna I mean, I just i i um I don't I certainly don't ever want to keep anyone from dinner, of course. Um, but I just want to make sure that we leave with sort of a, a direction or something that you all want to work on. I mean, I, I, I heard you, Richard, I heard you, Bev, I heard, you know, I know that, um, you all have felt maybe not, I, I hate if you felt unappreciated, but felt like maybe you didn't have enough of a direction or something to sort of sink your teeth into. And I want, that was the goal for today to come up with, um, a plan of this year of things to work on. Um, so I just want to, you know, we've, uh, we talked about the, the workforce, um, opt-in, we um, talked about, uh, you know, the um, what the counselors are looking at in terms of uh, garages. Are there like what what are our next steps? What do you all want to work on, and how can we how can we work together to for for you to do the important work that you do and help us move these things forward? Well, I think 
it on two things. You know, you've got the garage piece and also the Airbnb piece that just came up. And those are natural things for us to integrate and be a partner in educating the community and coming up with what might be a great compromise. And, you know, they weren't brought to us. And mm -hmm. um, that's, I don't, I think they should, you know, and, you know, I don't want to dwell on the past too much, although I can do it. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. So there really needs to be a commitment to say, listen, we, for a whole lot of reasons, it makes sense to make sure we're incorporating the housing partnerships uh, at every step of the way. And we can add that. And what was the first thing that you said wasn't brought to you? So you, the Airbnb, and what was this other one? Garage conversion ordinance. So, I mean, that's not, that doesn't exist. I know, but the discussion has started. Well, I mean, I mm -hmm. think, I, I think the counselors have said to Carolyn, hey, what do you think about this idea? It has not moved farther than that. Yeah, that's the time when we can start thinking about it too. I mean, that's what this is. I'm not trying to yeah. push back on you, but that's we are yeah. bringing it to you when it doesn't exist yet. This is an idea that's been brought up and we're bringing it to you and asking if you want to work on it. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm also thinking of some beautiful carriage houses in my hometown of Hudson, Massachusetts that were zoned very similarly. Um, and so they did some conversions there. And um I think I think I think at least one of those is um committed to section A or or 40D or something like that. 40 B, 40 B, 40 R could be. What is it? <laughs> you know, there's a whole handful. There's a whole handful of 40s. <laughs> Right, there is. Sure. Uh, so I was I was hoping that, you know, maybe as part of this work, we would be able to continue the discussion of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund in the future. I know it sounds complicated staffing wise. I know that there are a lot of moving pieces. Um, I don't know if some of the resistance has just been that starting to dig into what it might actually take to get staffing just like really requires, you know, like bringing out the, um, like the, just the laws about who has to be on that uh, board. So I'm, I'm wondering if there is, if we could come out of this meeting with some sort of commitment to at least continue the conversations. Um, we certainly can continue the conversation um, and it would be important to understand how it would be funded. You know, I, the, it, there was the possibility of the transfer fee, right? The real estate transfer fee, which didn't happen. Um, so, you know, we, I, I'm sure you all have followed to some extent the discussions around budgets and, you know, there's, we are, um, there's not a way to build more capacity in the planning department. There just isn't. Um, I wish I could build more capacity in every single department in the city. Um, they certainly could use it, but um, there's just, there's not enough um, revenue coming in to be able to do that. I think one of the, I think it would be beneficial maybe to have the conversation about what the goal is of creating or reinvigorating and would we reach that goal where we couldn't already reach it with the other resources that we have at hand. Um, and it goes back to that sort of cost benefit. Do we put a whole bunch of effort into something when we could achieve what our ultimate goals are anyway with what we have? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I think, um, so uh, the next on the agenda is a support letter for Habitat for Humanity for CPA Fall Rounds. So um, I am definitely in support of writing a support letter. Is anybody else? Yeah, and I'll oh, just say, oh, get I'll just say that we've, so where we are in the funding round is the CPC has the first eligibility letter. So there's not a lot of details, but it's about funding for the Cook Avenue project that we've been working on. Okay, so, great. Yeah. Thank you. I would move that we write the letter. 
there a second? Um, not in terms of the funding. So you might ask um, Megan what she has in terms of, so there's there's no um, financial ask yet officially to CPC for what that is. Okay. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions, but I didn't hear what was asked because it wasn't into a microphone. Do we have details about the project? Yes, that would be nice to hear. Is it is it all right for me to speak? Yes. Great. So my name is Megan McDonough. I'm the executive director of Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, and. Um, the Cook Avenue project was something that the city of Northampton has envisioned. Um, the planning department um, selected us as the developer for four affordable home ownership units to be built next to the conservation parking lot um, for the Fitzgerald Lake area at the proper, the old Moose Lodge property. Um, the planning department took it through zoning and there's a preliminary site plan showing two detached single family homes and two attached single family homes. Um, the property will be a condominium for the four houses with a shared parking lot, but each uh, home buyer will own their own home, whether it's attached or detached. Um, we would be marketing these homes to buyers who earn less than 60% of the area median income and then selling them with an affordable mortgage. Um, they would be protected in perpetuity with a deed restriction limiting resales to 80% of the area median income. Um, we, we put some extra subsidy into the mortgages for the first acquisition, but on the resale, they have to go and find their own mortgage for the buyers, which is why that's a little bit higher on resale. But that deed restriction is um, survives in perpetuity. So these would be permanently affordable and um, each resale would we'd help find the next income eligible buyer. Um, we're looking at three two-story units and one single story that could be adaptable for someone in a wheelchair if needed. We're, we're still, um, you know, we have this overarching plan, but we, we have not yet taken title to the land. We're waiting for the for the city to transfer title. So uh, it's still, but we have an agreement with the city that they will do so. So we're, that's why we are proceeding with applying for the funds. We don't, didn't want to miss this round. Um, we are hoping to start construction uh, in 2025. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. How much are you asking for, Megan? Do you want the ask is? Um, I think we were asking for 50000 per house. <clears throat> so I got a, a first and a second on the support letter. And so I'm wondering if everyone is in favor of that. Say aye. 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 Okay. Because you're hybrid, you have to do a Oh, thank you. Yes. Okay, because we're hybrid. So, right. So I'm going to go around. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to start to my left. Uh, Hannah? Richard? Yes. Bev? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And me? Yes. Okay, so we got that. Um, and then the housing bond bill update. Um, there was some of that in this discussion. I, I didn't know if you have more to add. I was just waving to Megan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... I think we could, it probably makes sense to come back um, okay. because we are past time and, and there's a lot of detail in it. So. Great, thank yeah. you. Okay, so we will put that for next month. 
Um, and then um, just to mention, there are three vacancies on the Northampton Housing Partnership. So if mm -hmm. anyone's interested in serving, um, please, um, if you're hanging out and you're just bored and have nothing else to do, come and hang out with us at the Northampton Housing Partnership. I have there's someone that I'm um I've been encouraging to oh, do wonderful who has a background. Well, this is great news. All right. Um, and so unless there's any other bit of business uh, not otherwise anticipated, then um I'd be looking for the final motion. I'll move to adjourn and I want to thank you both for coming. Been... Thank you both. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yes, okay. thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Okay. Oh, right. well, we need to we need to do the roll call. We need to do the roll call. Okay, okay. So Sorry. all those in all those in favor. So um so Richard? Aye. Bev? Yes. Hannah? Gordon? Yes. Melissa? Yep. And me. Yes. All right.